Uh, <laughs> the Darren, the Gav, Lul, author and creator of Nookies, as well as founder and former CEO of Keenspot. He also works as a postdoctoral physicist. <laughs> this is an asterisk. <laughs> yes, that's right. So this is taken directly from my Wikipedia page, which I cannot seem to change to make it happen. Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, alternate fact number two. actually staff this is alternate fact number two, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. As unique looking as any cartoon character with hair dyed a striking bright blue has had in videos called Gap Spottings in a number of web comics, including Schlock Mercenary, Sluggy Freelance, Clan of the Cats, Goats, and El Goonish Shaw. <laughs> yeah, and as a final fact, Dr. Bull does not know how to update Wikipedia in a way that someone won't immediately change back. Um, one of my uh, hiking buddies actually is at and and he was there during the epic of Scott Adams. And uh, my, one of my recurring nightmares is that someday I'm going to wake up and find out that I'm the guy with the pointy hair and the newbies, but you've had the good taste to keep me out of here. <laughs> anyway, take it away, Mark. Okay, I thought I'd just show everybody what uh, 20, 20 years. By the way, it turns out I can't do math, um, including just adding or doing date subtraction. Because I've been telling people it's been going on for 21 years and that I can drink. And for some reason, I was counting 1997 and 2017, obviously the end of 2017 to be So it's been around 20 years, despite what the title says. Um, you can totally trust my actual nuclear physics work. Um, I'm actually going to take this down now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, this is about a meter tall. I think it's about 35 liters of comics. This is harder to take down than put up. I'll tell you what, if you talk, I'll uh, work. How's that? Okay. Oh, that's, that's true. true. Oh, this is, this is the I feel better now. Okay. <laughs> so, um, quick show of hands, and don't feel bad for insulting me. How many people have even heard of this comic? Hey, that's not bad. How many people actually read it regularly? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right, right? There are other people. I can tell you it was in the Daily Cow. Yeah. Well, it used to be in the Daily Cow. They stopped putting comics in there, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, and I just kept going. Um, so I've never even heard of newbies. I thought there'd be more people, but uh, should you read it? Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, one of my uh, points of... of, of uh, Pride is, uh, there's a site out there called TV Tropes, where they go and they talk about the things out there that you are used to hearing about, like, you know, jumping the shark, phrases like that. Um, there's a thing out there called Archive Panic, which is, uh, I'm used as a reference for this, <laughs> which is to say that when you go on the internet and you say, oh, I kind of like this comic strip, uh, maybe I want to read it from the beginning. Holy crap, it's been going for 20 years? No <laughs> way it means something like that. So I do have a hard time generating new readers. And seeing as how everyone, like, or like half of this room is like the age of my comic, then uh, <laughs> that's something to be said. Um, well, is it popular? That's actually a really hard question to answer on the internet. And if anybody tells you differently, they're lying. Um, or giving you alternative facts. And uh, so you can look at my stats. So you can't really tell by like unique IP addresses. I think this is an interesting, uh, 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 um, an interesting lesson on the internet if not comics, is that if, because some people use the same IP addresses and some people, their IP addresses change every time, you can't really judge strictly off of that. So the one thing you can kind of tell, you can definitely tell the number of page views, the number of pages visited on your site, total, integrated. And you can tell basically the, about the number of unique people on any given day. That's about all the information you get. So these are my stats. This, this middle level, depending on how you count them, are the number of unique people every single day. And on the, on the top days are the days that it updates, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And there's about 3,500 people that visit on those days. And then on, on the off days, there's about 2,000 people. And so you gotta figure, that means there's about 1,500 people that, that know when to actually look at the comic on the day that it updates. Those are the, we'll call those ex-obsessed. And then if you, you just take basically the difference between an on day and an off day, and those are those people. So everybody else is that constant uh, DC voltage, as it were, of, uh, of readers. And that's the two, you judge that roughly by the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday crowd. 
And then I figured I had to, it is an engineering colloquium, you gotta throw some math into the talk, right? And so at this point, you have to make an assumption about how often people uh, come back and read it. And so um, somebody raised their hand if you read it, you do read my comic strip occasionally. Anybody, how about you? How often do you read it? How often do I read it? Like once a month. Great, I love that number. Because if you take 30 and you multiply by 2,000 and you add 3,500, I've got 63,500 readers. <laughs> and that's not bad. On the other hand, if you figure people come back on average once a week, then I've got more like 24,500 readers. So I'll leave it up to you to decide how many people actually read this thing. So why? This was me 20 years ago. Um, and here I am reading The Daily Cal. And anybody who knows me knows that I like to complain a lot. Um, and I, one day I was complaining about the comic strips. Comics suck, life sucks, everything sucks, but mostly the comics. And this is Dan Waugh. He, he was a grad student back then, became a postdoc. He taught in the department for a while. Probably there's nobody in the room that took a class from him. Did anyone take a class with Dan Waugh, Dr. Dan Waugh? Wow, well, see, my professors will, will, will find it annoying when I talk about how old I am. Um, but we've reached that point. So he challenged me. He said, stop complaining, write your own comic. And I'm like, I don't know what to write about. And then just at that point, um, another student came in, his name was Luca. And uh, for some reason he decided to say, bow before King Luca. And uh, at the same time, Danny was like, you should write about us. So he just became a, sh a, a, a character, King Luca, from that one interaction. Uh, us Nukies, as hopefully everybody here knows who's in the department, you can abbreviate nuclear engineer and Nuki, right? The same way Mackie or that sort of a thing. Yay! I have a comic strip. So these were the first sketches. By the way, I didn't know how to draw. Let's start with that. And I actually really wanted to learn how to draw. So, I mean, I would like encourage anybody in the room, not necessarily drawing, if there's any, I hear all the time people like, oh, I would love to do something like that, but I, I don't know how to do it. I'm any talent. I'm not a natural talent. Yeah, I suck too. Um, but you do anything for 20 years, you're going to get good at it. So uh, that's my only lesson. You know, if you can't draw hands, you, 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 have the, the, you, you have people putting their hands in their pockets. It's the, the best thing to do. Um, so anyway, right, this was the first strip. Uh, it basically, it's about uh, hanging, probably most of you have had this, uh, this, this, this uh, point in your life where you've hung out in a bar or something, and somebody said, what do you do? I'm a nuclear engineer. And they're just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first trip. I think it set the tone pretty well. And then everybody that I've ever talked to that actually knows my strip from the beginning says the same thing. And that's the best strip I ever drew was the fifth. <laughs> <I'm> 3,000. <laughs> um, this was four years in the future when I drew this strip, by the way. This was meant to, to, to talk about the graduating the, the incoming freshmen, when they graduated, the opportunities that they would have available to them. And I think a lot of people still <laughs> think it's, uh, it's uh, kind of the same today. Um, speaking of peaked, uh, there's another reason why I I'm, I'm have a Wikipedia page. Uh, and that's because as part of this, I, uh, I started a, a, a web comics publishing business, and I'll get more into it later. It's called Keenspot. I owned it for about seven years. Uh, it's basically because if you take a whole bunch of, of artists together and you say, who here can program in Perl, which was the language back then, there's only one person who raises their hand, and that's a nuclear engineer. Um, but there was this survey that came out in January 2007 that said I was the 10th <laughs> top person in the world of web comics. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> gone downhill ever since then. Here's that Wikipedia page. Uh, one thing that didn't come out with the reading is that there's always something on here that says, oh, is this person really notable enough to be on here? <laughs> um, I come and go. So I like to think I'm just, just on the verge of people actually knowing who the hell I am. I can tell you if I didn't have blue hair, it would be done. <laughs> um, but of course, you know, Wikipedia didn't even exist back in 1997, right? I mean, things have changed a lot. The internet's changed a lot. Um, as for instance, here was my web page back in 2000, and here's my web page now. <laughs> That's right, despite the fact that I programmed a website that has thousands of comics auto-updating on it, um, 
ran an internet company at the worst possible time. I've never actually updated the HTML on my web page. <laughs> you are still looking at 1997 technology. This was actually as far back as the Wayback Machine would go. Um, <laughs> it wasn't much different before then. Um, so uh, one of my biggest uh, points of pride is uh, what was mentioned actually on the page, is gap spotting. Something about the way I look and the tenth prominent place that I took in a small part of history. Uh, for a little while, I found uh, people were actually putting, for instance, my character into their comic strips. So this is, uh. this is a strip called uh, uh, General Protection Fault, in which my character, Gav, um, who looked like me 20 years ago, um, was put into the comic strip. Uh, and so I like to tie the part of my page where I tally them up. That's one. My character appears in General Protection Fault. Well, this is General Protection Fault a number of years later in which I appear in the strip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's one for me. Um, and then if you go on, you find I appear in a strip called Goats where I get my head chopped in half. That's fun. Um, I'm a mad scientist with actually the wrong color hair. I used to have a lot more hair, by the way. Um, that's another one. Um, this is another one that was called Alguna Shive. Nobody knows how to pronounce it, so don't feel bad, Carl. Uh, apparently, I'm, I'm part of a, a Gav's hair color. Um, I was three-dimensionally rendered uh, for somebody else. Um, here's a strip where my character and I appear in the very same panel, so one for each. So if you total them all up, oh, and this was a little bit disturbing. I had a little fangirl for a little while on the East Coast. Uh, here she had her artist friend draw me as her bride. <laughs> this is fun. Um, this is one of the best ones. This one's called Schlock Mercenary. This is where I free. He, this is a strip that takes place three thousand or a thousand years in the future, in, in like the year three thousand, um, where they have teleportation technology. It's like the transporters, but they, they can do you know entire ships, and um, there's there's a billion of them all throughout the galaxy, and that's how everybody gets around. And then one day it comes to light that they're not actually teleporting you. Of course, what they're doing is they're Trent, they are communicating everything there is about you, the position, you know, quantum mechanics be damned, the position and momentum of every a part of your being, and reassembling it with matter on the other end, and then they kill you. And so they knew if anybody knew that, nobody would ever use them again. And so I apparently find out that this is the case, and I'm about to make it go public, and so they want to kill me so that it doesn't go public. And so in order to preserve myself, I, jump, I reprogram the transporter, I teleport through it, and I make 950 million copies of myself. <laughs> <laughs> so from then on, in the Schlock Mercenary universe, I am the single biggest demographic in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> the Guinness Import Company has to cater to me. Uh, <laughs> that was the time in my life I drank, I drank nothing but Guinness. So, um, so if you total up the number of times my character has been in somebody else's comic strip versus the times I've been in a comic strip, I actually win. I like this. 17 to 24. Again, nothing has happened whoops, since uh, 2007. Um, so this is a this is a this is a new way. I'm you know I'm used to giving uh, physics talks, and I thought about how how do I actually talk about 20 years of a strip that doesn't bore you all to tears. Um, I'm going to try to explain the plot line of the last 20 years as quickly as possible. It's not going to work. So the first strip is 1997. This is what Gav looked like back then. Uh, he created a virtual pet called Terry. Um, he becomes a mad scientist somewhere around 1998. Um, and then he creates a giant robot ant. Pretty much every strip after that deals with these three aspects of, uh, of, the, of the strip. So he moves into the Echeverry uh, somewhere around 1999. Uh, in 2000, King Luca invents a holiday. This is one of my, my proudest moments. It's called Agnostica. It's a, <laughs> it's a winter holiday for the secular, non-secular. Which was secular? I love the word non-secular, by the way, uh, because secular means not religious. So non-secular means not not religious, right? <laughs> it's a double negative word. Um, uh, at this point in 2000, Terry, the, the artificial intelligence, takes over the robot ant. Hilarity ensues. Gav has to escape to Antarctica where he meets a, a penguin because every comic strip has to have a penguin. That's a rule. Uh, and he defeats the ant by charging up a giant electric zombie squid. So 
Oh. Totally based in reality. Um, I like to think up until 2017, everything was physically possible in, in today's science capabilities. Um, I was, I shouldn't be uh, admitting this to my previous professors, but I graduated a long time ago. Uh, in 1997, I was still a student, of course, doing this for the Daily Californian. Uh, Keenspot, the company, started somewhere around 2000. I had not yet graduated. Um, I like to point out here is, actually on a condensed scale, the stock market, actually it's probably just NASDAQ, the technical stock market. Uh, there's the year 2000 when I started. That was the perfect time to start an internet company. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Google has a, a motto, uh, do no evil. Our motto was lose no money. And we were probably the only internet company at the time with, with, with that motto. Um, so we survived for seven years after that, not losing money, which is a miracle in of itself. Um, I did publish one book way around 2000, never found enough time to make another book. So at some point, in the near future, there's going to be one huge companion that will cost a million, a hundred dollars. Um, so moving forward, uh, we get to 2001. This is where Gav dies, the first time. Um, he goes to the afterlife, he meets an Egyptian goddess. Her name's Ma'at, he falls in love. She steals his heart, yeah. literally. Uh, I don't know, can you see the, the, the graphics? I knew it would be small, but... Um, on the other hand, eventually he comes back to life uh, and finds that Terry has evolved quite a bit since that original image. Um, and it turns out he actually, Terry, the artificial intelligence, has actually replaced his glasses with basically LCD screens. So I like to point out that I invented Google, Google goggles <laughs> <laughs> 10 years before they did. Um, he also has a webcam on his glasses, which oh. came maybe five, ten years after this. Maybe it was 15 years. Yeah, more like 15 years. Um, at this point, I start getting complicated in my storylines. Um, I do, I do a, a strip or a, a series called Danny's Inferno, which is basically Dante's <laughs> Inferno, except they're going upwards through the floors of, uh, of uh, Soda Hall. Corey Hall? Soda. Which one's next door? Um, of course, I had to add a few floors. Uh, interesting thing about that storyline is uh, I started reading Dante's Inferno not long before I started actually drawing it, not realizing that two thirds of that book happens on the seventh and eighth levels of hell. So by the time I got to the seventh level of hell, or soda, I realized I was only one third of the way through the storyline and it had already gone on for about a year. So I had to rush that thing through two floors. Um, so do your research. All right. I finally graduated in 2003, uh, and I started working at, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And um, this is, I think, this is a point where uh, Gav runs into these, these uh, Christian goths that become followers of Danny. Um, <laughs> and I just put this up there because I think this is the first time I drew at Chaveri Hall. Um, this is a hard, hard building to, to draw. Um, Gav dies again. Uh, this is 2005. I'm still working at Berkeley Lab and running Keenspot. And goes to the afterlife. And here I've developed a far more robust afterlife. It's all the forgotten gods. <laughs> Basically all the gods nobody believes anymore. And they're all living in the same city. Um, where he meets Apophis, the serpent that circles the earth and battles him amongst other things. Uh, this was my first storyline that lasted longer than a year. So I think this is an interesting aside. I've seen comics go through kind of a uh, evolution that television is kind of going through in the same way. And it all has to do with the medium. And I found this really interesting. So when there were only newspaper comics, you could never do a storyline that lasted longer than two weeks, because you couldn't count on anybody having read any of the, the strips before then. Um, when web comics came around, we all suddenly, we all were in that mode, but we started to realize you can do really long storylines and count on how somebody having read the entire archives before they reached 3,000 strips. Um, and it completely changed the way that a lot of people did, did comics. Well, now it's come back full circle because now we have the Facebook world in which comics need to be shareable. You can't share a comic if you have to have read 3,000 strips before it. So it's funny, comics nowadays are a lot more like they were back in the newspaper days 20 years ago, where it has to be a one-off. It, it helps if it doesn't have 
um, recognizable characters. It should be focused on people that think that they are a, a, a small demographic, when in fact they're actually a large demographic. And I'm not going to name names, but this is a very popular character for today's <laughs> oh, <laughs> audience. Oh, is it I'm blocking it? Um, stick figures are great. Non-recognizable characters are great. And I blame that entirely on Facebook. But I don't care. Um, moving on, uh, this year-long storyline um, takes us down into LA, where we actually go to Gav's uh, childhood home, which wasn't his childhood home. This is actually my parents' home. Um, my mom was so proud of this that now lining the staircase is this entire storyline. I think that's going to be good. It doesn't end well. Um, and that's when, whoops, sorry, Yuki's turns 10. And I made this little animation to show, that was Gav 10 years before. Yeah, wait for it. <laughs> Ta-da, that's what he looks like at, at 10. <laughs> uh, I literally made that by taking Wonder Woman from the, from the Linda Hamilton days on a computer with a thin piece of paper and tracing over her to get the whole spin sequence. <laughs> Um, I'm still working at Berkeley Lab and Keenspot, but at 2007, I sell my shares because I really didn't like my partners and I really didn't like the workload. And uh, um, Keenspot still exists, it's interesting. It doesn't seem to have advanced or anything, but it still hosts comics. Um, the one thing I'll say about it is um, Keenspot was kind of the, the, the comics that we said we thought were worth publishing, but we used the same software to let anybody publish a comic. We called that Comic Genesis. We originally called it Keen Space, but they were too close, nobody knew the difference, so we had to rebrand Keen Space as Comic Genesis. Um, within less than a year, I would say thousands of comics joined Comic Genesis. It was basically the MySpace, which was popular back then, of comics. Um, all you had to do was, was draw a comic, scan it, and put it on the internet. And, and put it on this site, and, the, and the, the updating would take care of itself. And you'd get all those features, like the, the, uh, the, the next button and the, the calendar and everything. So there's a lot of people that thought I was single-handedly responsible for ruining web comics on the internet. <laughs> because basically, if you can draw on the back of a napkin and scan it in, you can have a comic on the internet. People hated that. <laughs> so uh, in the end, when I left, there were probably Somewhere like three or four or five thousand comics on Comic Genesis. Most of them not updating, but um, but I'm pretty proud of that too. That's when I started working at Lawrence Livermore Lab, and I've been there to this day. Uh, at this point, I got political. Uh, that's when Prop 8 passed, and I had no, I did not think Prop 8 was going to pass, and so I didn't really feel the need to comment on it. This was the the gay marriage bill. Um, so the interesting thing is, I did an entire sequence about about, you know, without getting too far into, into the actual politics, which can be contentious, I did a whole sequence on it after it had passed, because <laughs> I just felt that I had to speak up. But it was just a completely the wrong time, of course. But it did take some 10, five years, something like that, for, for, for things to happen after that. Um, I have been more political since then, but, um, but mostly it's about giant robot ants and, uh, and, uh, and, and electric zombie squid. Uh, in 2009, in order to contest, oh, by the way, this, what I actually said was, the argument about Prop 8 was that gay people shouldn't marry. It was mostly a religious-based argument. So my reasoning was, well, if that's the case, why do you allow atheists to marry? Um, and so Prop NA in the strip is all about a battle for atheists being allowed to marry. So in order to contest the law, the two, two of the main characters had to get married so that they could be affected, because you can't contest the law if you're not affected. So they get married. Uh, kind of artificially. Um, in 2010, there's a main bar in it. It's called Flakes. Um, I don't know how many people in the room remember. There used to be a bar. It's right where Pappy's is now, called Blake's. It's a famous, famous blues bar. Been around since like the 40s, maybe 60s. I don't know. Anybody know? 40s? Yeah, there's but Blake's and Davis, too. Oh, really? Um, it was an interesting thing. I blew up Flakes in the comic strip. Blake's closed the very same week. <laughs> like a few days later, with no warning. Like the people that worked there didn't know. I was on shift at the Cyclotron, and I'm checking Facebook, and all of the all my bartender friends were like, "Oh my God, it's the last night. Everybody has to come down." So like a, it's like a week after I drew this. So I meant to have this repaired. I had to I had to leave it blown up. <laughs> uh, got me a little worried. Then I started a three-year story. 
where basically in order to avoid that artificial intelligence, they have to get to Michigan. And in order to avoid <laughs> the artificial intelligence, which knows that they're going to Michigan, they decide to go the other way, which is basically gets Michigan by going west. And so that's why it took, takes three years. So they go to, uh, and this is basically an opportunity for me to make fun of every place that I've ever visited on Earth. So uh, they go to Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Actually, I've never been to St. Petersburg, but uh, I really wanted to draw the, the things. Mostly I'm showing these because these are the pictures that it took me the longest to draw, and I'm just, I'm just trying, to, trying to brag. Um, <laughs> is there another interesting thing about this thing about the strip? Um, I tend to feel guilty if the, if the punchline is not very funny and I spend more time drawing. Um, on the other hand, if I know I'm going to spend a lot of time drawing, eh, yeah, the punchline, it, it needs to be there or not. It's really hard for me to find a strip that I'm proud of both the artwork and the punchline. Um, at this point, the Gav figures out a way to interact with the artificial intelligence through, the glass, through his glasses, and, and he starts battling them. These, these little thought processes. And the thought processes take on these icons. And so he goes, he's basically traveling the world looking for these little icons to battle. And the first one he battles is Pikachu. So for the record, I invented, as I said, the glasses-mounted <laughs> web camera, VR goggles, and Pokemon Go. I just <laughs> want to stress that. This was in 2013. <laughs> and a few other things, but we won't get into that. Um, still working at Lawrence Livermore Lab. We make it to the, to the final four years. Um, I'm just going to throw this to the end because I'm still working there. Uh, this is what Gav looks like now. He's being chased by the FBI at this point for reasons unknown. Uh, and so in order to get off a plane, he basically cuts his hair and temporarily dyes it black, temporarily gives himself a beard, which ends up growing in later. Um, Danny invents color. <laughs> this is where I start to lose it. Um, I've been planning this, this storyline for... Uh, since the beginning, I just really wanted to, to, to break the fourth wall so that nobody could ever fix it again. <laughs> Basically what happens is for the last 10 years, Gav has been working on, or uh, Danny's been working on a grand unification theorem. And uh, it's unspoken in the strip, but uh, when he actually solves the grand unification theorem, he discovers, of course, the nature of the universe. And what's the nature of the universe? Oh, it's a comic strip. <laughs> His universe, not our universe. Yeah. Once he discovers that they're living in a comic strip, that's the unstated part. He starts inventing technology. So he invents color. He also invents um, animation, um, <laughs> uh, time travel. So there's a part in the strip where you read the strip, they travel back in time. If you go back to that strip that they travel to, they're in the background. Um, but the first time you read it, if you hadn't read the strip where uh, he traveled back in time. They're not in the background. Very proud of that technology. So I'm having fun with it at this point. Um, the reason Gav's being chased by the, uh, by the FBI is because he, because of a spurned lover, well, never lover, somebody who was spurned, uh, has become uh, a congresswoman and is basically has it out to get both him and the impending robot invasion, which is, of course, a fabricated lie in order to get her more power. Uh, as a result, they're getting to be at war with the U.S. military. Um, at some point, Danny has uh, uh, shot Gav with the color gun, thinking it was actually the trope modifier. Um, and that's what Gav looks like now. Oh, and by the way, he grew a beard because he was stuck under, underground for a number of months and then decided to shave into a goatee to thwart the FBI. So basically, for the past three years, I've been making Gav look like me <laughs> a little bit at a time. Um, again. And finally, uh, just this is a few days ago, uh, they all pack up into the robot ant and shoot off as drones controlled with uh, sniper rifles on them, controlled by Terry, are taking over the world. So, totally about nuclear engineering, right? Um, so, in the next, I guess, 10 minutes, maybe try five <laughs> minutes, let's play Did It Happen? I want to go over uh, some strips, and then you want you all to guess, did these things happen? Are these things true, or did they happen? Um, so yes, uh, Gav is talking to his then-girlfriend, uh, who is terrified of radiation, that yes, in fact, just by sleeping next to a person, you get a certain amount of radiation. Uh, <laughs> is that true? Yep. Yes? It's true, and it happened. My girlfriend did not want to sleep with me after that <laughs> 20 years ago. 
Um, I'm not saying that ever again. Uh, is it true? Do you excrete a million atoms of plutonium in your urine, urine every day? Anyone? No. No. It is true. It is. And this line has never worked as a pickup line in a bar. <laughs> um, is it real? Um, at one point, Gav is in Zimbabwe, and uh, you know, who knew a hundred trillion Zimbabwean dollars is an insulting bribe? Uh, and here he's talking about, you know, where would I get changed for a mole dollar bill? Has there ever been a mole dollar bill? <laughs> Anyone? Shout out an answer. No, there has not been a mole dollar bill. By the way, this is a hundred trillion dollars. <laughs> Zimbabwean dollars. It's a little ratty, I've had it in my wallet. Um, however, this is the um, inflation rate of Zimbabwe. It's only because they like re-normalize their currency at some point. Here we're at a hundred, and you can't see it. There's 10 to the 32. In fact, a mole dollar bill is not large enough <laughs> for the devaluation of Zimbabwean currency from 2001 to 2009 even. And um, not worth the paper it's printed on. In fact, the only reason there's not a mole dollar bill is because the paper company would no longer send Zimbabwe paper after this, this one. <laughs> so yeah, there's your $100 trillion. Um, how about this one? Uh, <laughs> and here's a point at which it's being explained to Gav that, you know, it looks bad for the department if you don't graduate. It looks bad for the department if you get kicked out. It looks bad for the department if you take too long to graduate. Which basically means, you know, they have to get rid of you one way or another. <laughs> Did somebody actually say this to me in this department? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ed? <laughs> it was not my advisor, it was in fact Ed Morris, and he passed this comic strip out at my graduation. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, how about this one? Okay, so here's a, used to be a radioactive source. Um, there, nobody knows what it is. You can't dispose of a, even a former radioactive source if you don't know what it is, right? And so, there are ways of determining what it is. You could put it into a neutron beam. You could look at the prompt gamma rays that come out. Or you could crank the hell out of the neutrons and look at the delayed neutrons that come out later. Um, of course, what that does is it makes it radioactive. It makes a non-radioactive source radioactive. Was this a story that actually happened? You were there for that. <laughs> that is true. I used to be the sealed source manager at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and I handed this, this non-radioactive source that used to be a radioactive source off to these people with a neutron, uh, uh, not beam, but a source, and they handed me back radioactive source. <laughs> like that do no harm thing that, that, that <laughs> medical doctors apparently does not apply to nuclear physicists. Um, how are we doing? Okay. Let's play. Does such a paper exist? Did anyone curve fit the Philippines? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I really want to. <laughs> I had to throw this in there because everything was true and something had to be false, right? Um, finally, um, here's a strip where I decided to see how geeky my audience might actually be, and I had one of the characters speak in encryption. And I left all the clues, if anybody wanted to figure out what that person said, in this panel basically gives you enough information that if you are really good at encryption, that maybe you can actually de-encrypt what this person says. So, you know, what it, did it happen? Is it true? Have I forgotten the punchline to this strip? <laughs> I think you all know the answer to that. Yes! yes. <laughs> In fact, there's like three strips. I have no idea what he says because I didn't write it down. So, <laughs> if anyone in this room is geekier than I am, <laughs> I don't think I actually have the capability. Please let me know what I wrote. <laughs> so finally, here we're at the end, and we will have 15 minutes for questions, and hopefully there will be some. Um, I like this. This is another one of these pickup lines that Gab is always giving. So Planck's constant walks into a bar, <laughs> right? Because, because. <laughs> so um, 
I, I don't know, I thought this was so funny that when I went to Burning Man last year, I made a bar called the H Bar. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted everybody to see my handiwork there. <laughs> I'm telling you, one of the things, in fact, one of my strips basically says, it's after this joke, it's, um, one time I drank so much Guinness, I got the bends. And then the punchline is, the best jokes are the ones nobody understands. <laughs> yeah. So Guinness is made with nitrogen. The uh, bends is when you get too much nitrogen in your bloodstream. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always think the best jokes are the ones where only two people understand it on Earth. You and the person that you have to find. Um, <laughs> so you make a bar like this, the people that understand it think it's the best thing they've ever seen. Um, I have yet to tell, no, I think one person has understood the, the, the Guinness joke. Uh, so thank you for indulging me. Um, and I will take any or all questions. Allison, first question. Yes. What's an average time to do a comic strip? Uh, each one is to, that is a variable answer, to draw two hours, to write ahead of time anywhere from two minutes to five hours. Okay. So if I have writer's block, that can be an issue. Uh, if you figure an average of two to three hours, uh, this represents more than a full year of my life doing nothing but drawing. <laughs> and not sleeping. Right. I used to say a year of my waking life, but now I've done the math. If I were to not sleep and do nothing from January 1st until J December 31st but draw, that would represent how much I've actually worked on this comic show. <laughs> Interesting. The reason I asked the question is my father was a cartoonist. I yeah. think I told you that. He drew Winnie Winkle, which was oh. a, it, his comic strip began in 1920 and ran until 1997. Uh, started with my, my father joined it in 1937, went away to the war, came back and drew it until 1981. He worked on it probably 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week. And it was the old yeah. fashioned thing where you have the three frames daily and six frames on Sundays, so you had to get them in like eight weeks ahead of time into the syndicate, mm -hmm. New York Daily New Chicago Tribune syndicate. Um, but it was the old style that you don't remember it was the uh, Winnie Winkle, Brenda Starr, Terry the Pirates, Prince Valiant, Epic, yeah, yeah. and it was right. But yeah. Anyway, so that's it. Well, one thing. So one thing I'd like to point out. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. This took five hours, strip number one, and it's terrible. Um, but most of it was redrawing the same thing over and over and over again until you could at least tell different people. Um, I had no idea what size to work at and what that, or anything like that. I went with this size because I had a scanner at this fit on. Uh, what I found out later is, of course, most people work at much bigger size, and then it looks much better when you shrink it down. Um, I wish I'd kind of known that ahead of time, and then I would have to buy another scanner. Um, <laughs> oh, and the paper is much, much, much more expensive. It, yeah. it, 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 it doesn't go up linearly or yeah. quadratically with uh, it's two dimensions. Um, so yeah, eventually I got into my groove, but of course there's only so many hours in the day, and this is not my job, so I'm, I'm happy at two hours. But um, yeah, if it, I mean, I can. It would be really neat if it was like you know your actual job. You can spend an entire day on your strip. You do a lot more. Which is like, why it's a little bit weird when you see what I'll call the newspaper comics uh, as it used to be when um, sometimes they didn't look at Garfield or something. Not a lot of work seems to have gone into every Garfield, but uh, there are 18 people on staff. Um, wow. Uh, so, any more questions? Yeah. To have a successful comic, which is more important, the drawings or the punchline? Very important. Don't want to be too cynical about <laughs> the answer to this. Um, I'd see neither. Punchline over drawing. As I've said, nowadays, not necessarily in the past. Um, but certainly, even if you look in the past, I mean, look at the really popular comics out there. You know, Peanuts was, in its day, really funny. And I would say, in its day, it was probably at its peak in the 70s, I think, it was probably the funniest. And his artwork started better and just kind of got simpler and simpler and simpler. Dilbert was very funny and popular and not well drawn, or not it cleanly drawn, we'll put it that way. Um, I know a lot of strips like that, and, and really what carries them are the punchlines. 
On the other hand, you could look at, say, Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes back then, which was both well-drawn and punchline. Uh, nowadays, I think the most important thing is shareability, unfortunately. Um, and to be shareable, of course, it should be funny, it's, but it's got to be something people resonate with. Um, you know, a lot of people in this room might resonate with nuclear engineering jokes, but I might get a few shares on Facebook, and that's it. But if you can make fun of, of uh, software developers uh, and, and people that think they're in a small industry and therefore they're getting an inside joke, but they're actually in a very large industry and lots and lots of people share these things. So those tend to be the things that take off nowadays. Um, so it's interesting. It, it does, you do have to not only, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's variable with time, right? It's, it's a dynamic answer to that question. These days, uh, the way to get popular is for people to share you on Facebook. That's just how today's world are. So how do you get shared on Facebook? You resonate with certain audiences. Um, artwork does not seem to be correlated. Uh, yeah. But the people that are following you, like your fans or whatever, yeah. are they more into your drawings or? Well, I have a like I have, because I've been doing this 20 years and I haven't changed my style. I'm I'm a throwback. So I'm doing the long storylines, and there aren't many of us left. Um, at least not many of us popular. Like. And that's an interesting thing, is I kind of expected my readership to go down. I expected it to go up or go down. It's been kind of constant for, since the Keen Spot days. So Keen Spot, we did a really good job of, crop, of, of sharing traffic. We had a box every day that appeared on every website that said, hey, go check out this comic today. We've got these boosts in our readership uh, over the course of those seven years. Since then, you know, I took all the ads off my site. I got sick of the, of the business. Um, and don't really talk to the old cartoonists so much anymore. We don't cross, uh, we don't cross, send each other cross traffic. And it's just been flat ever since then. And I think that's really weird because you'd think either people would get sick of it and they'd stop reading and you'd never get any new readers, or it would take off. People would love this thing and it would go up. But, so I don't know. Do I have all the old readers for the last 10 years? Or do, is the, is the, what would you say, the, the, the DRDX, the DRDT, the, the change in readers over time, maybe it's the, I get as many new readers as old readers. I have no way of, of actually engaging that. Or maybe it's all just robots now. It's all just the search engines finding their site. I, I have, it's not easy. Nobody links to me, I'll put it that way. Like, I, I can check to see which people link to me on the internet, and it never changes. So it seems to be all the old readers. Yeah. Have you ever been a guest cartoonist? Remember, you know, some, sometimes uh, like Gilbert will have um, yeah uh, other cart other cartoonists. So back in the day, back in 1997, the most popular comic on the internet was called Sluggy Freelance. And he was doing these storylines too, and he only started a year before I did. I think uh, this image is actually from a strip I did for him. So he used to he less than a year into it, he got sick of it, and he started doing these guest weeks and stuff. And so. Because we basically had the same publisher at the time, he, uh, I got to do a couple of weeks of, of his, or I think in two of his strips, in which he gets nuked at the end. <laughs> um, that and uh, for a while, when the internet was new and web comics were new, and we we're all getting to know each other and having fun, uh, we would do a comic switch every uh, April first, for April Fool's Day, and so I think I did three of those for various strips that you would have never heard of. Um, what, what would now be your kinds of motivations for continuing the strip? I'm sure your, your yeah. reasons for doing it have changed over the years. <laughs> what are I am addicted to attention. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and like any addiction, you go through that blissful phase of, uh, of, of, of positive feedback, and then eventually in the long term, it's just avoiding the negative. Uh, so people, the fans used to be much more active in the old days too, and uh, they would come in on the forums, they would you know, send you email, you got a lot of interaction with your fans and it was great. And that has fallen off a lot in the years. Um, and so I do feel like I'm just throwing those comics out into the, into the ether and hopefully somebody is getting some joy out of it. Um, you have to make it interactive. Yeah, um, uh, 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 I mean, people interact in a different way than they used to. Again, it's all Facebook. I don't even have yeah, a Facebook link on my page. That's yeah, how old school yeah. and lazy I am. 
Um, so I do blame myself for, for a lot of that lack of interactivity. Uh, but you know, to answer your question, I, I know in the back of my mind there are 20 to 60,000 people reading this thing. And I, it's just, I can't imagine not having that many people listen to me anymore. <laughs> Again, it's like it's it's less about the joy I get from it, and more about avoiding the the withdrawal symptoms that I get without having. So, to, uh, and with four minutes left, I'm going to let everybody in on a little secret. The strip is ending. You guys are the only ones that really know that. I'm not ending drawing though. There was going to be a there's going to be a spinoff. Uh, so that's the rumor. Um, <laughs> spread it far and wide. But I do realize, I mean, it's, it's a little weird going through your life telling one story, right? How many people do that? Look at, you know, look at television. Uh, TV shows go for like seven seasons. The Simpsons notwithstanding. Um, people write books, right? And they may stick with the same genre, but they write different books. And kind of the most miserable writers and artists are the people that are always forced to do the same books over and over again. So maybe some people <laughs> like it. But I kind of decided after 20 years, maybe I want to tell a different story. Um, and so I've been thinking about this for a very long time. And it's one of the reasons you kind of notice at the end, everything got really wacky. Um, it's my time to be wacky. And it's my time to do things that you can't come back from. And that's an interesting thing about storytelling, too. There's this thing out there I, I heard called the, this, it's like the Superman complex. or I forget what it's called. But if you look at Superman, it's been around since, since the 30s. And when Superman was first around, he couldn't even fly. He could leap tall buildings. It's so weird to hear him to hear that now. Well, he can fly. Of course, he can leap tall buildings. Well, he couldn't at first. Um, and every time they drew a Superman comic, he kind of had to be a little bit more heroic than the last Superman comic, right? Um, so at first, he's defending old ladies being robbed of purses, and then he's fighting bank robbers, and then he's fighting Hitler, and then. And then pretty quickly, he's saving the Earth every single comic strip. It has to be saving the Earth every single time. Because every, every story has to be greater the, a greater consequence than the story before. Then he has to save the, the, you know, the whole galaxy. Then he has to save the whole universe. Then he had to make a, a multiverse so he could save it. Um, <laughs> and it keeps going. And that's why they, I think they have to reboot the universes every so often, because it, it, it spirals out of control. So I've been, I noted that, and I was really careful you know, all the way through probably about here to make sure the consequences did not prevent, did not make it unrealistic for them to be graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> um, that all went out the window about three years ago and that was intentional. I'm like, I'm going after the storyline you can't come back from. There's no way they can go back to their normal lives after what's going on here now. And that's because I know the ending. And, the, and it's kind of neat. It's, it's because like, you think of your favorite TV show. None of them got to end on their terms, right? It's always a great TV show, and then bam, it's canceled. It's like, it would be really nice to actually plan the ending of a story, right? And um, books are that way, but this is a serial. Serials very often don't get their proper ending, so I'm kind of excited about that. Um, you know, the comic strip Luann caught my attention because yeah. the character of ages that read about one year per decade. Yeah. And I was wondering yeah. if you've ever been tempted to integrate some of your Livermore experiences, perhaps? Or? Oh, there's lots of Livermore experiences. Are there? Okay. First of all, this, I always say, this moves at about two to one, uh -huh. which means Gav has been in school for 10 years. It's 20 years ago. Um, there's one sequence in here, for instance, where at Livermore, there were these subcontractors, electrical subcontractors, that did something wrong. They almost electrocuted each other. and. They decided that the normal method of punishment was not working. So they made this touchy-feely video that the entire lab had to, had to watch, where these two subcontractors sat there and they talked about how, how bad they felt. They talked about their feelings. They didn't talk about the, 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 uh, the, the safety incident at all. They talked about their feelings for half an hour. These, these two big, burly electricians were talking about how, how bad they felt and how how they will go. And I realized, oh my god, that is the worst punishment I could possibly imagine. I got two weeks of strips <laughs> out of that one incident. Well, or for example, if you kept in touch with Luca or Danny Hua. No, no, and I also realized very quickly there's a bad idea to, pay, to base characters off of real people. Uh, it limits you. 
you know, you kind of, in some ways, King Luca was more based off of a thing he did one day than the actual person. Danny was Danny. Um, but I realized quickly, for instance, um, the main character, Gab, uh, has a bartender fetish. He loves bartenders. There's a bartender in the strip, or all of it, there's like three bartenders in the strip. They're all based on real bartenders. You'd think that would get me in trouble with the bartenders. Well, the bartenders don't read it. That got me in trouble with my girlfriend for, for a period when basically Gab would be fawning over this bartender, and then I'd be like, well, I'm off to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> so I realized very quickly, it's just a bad idea to base comics off of real people. It limits what you can do with the character. You might like, kill off the character, and that person's gonna get kind of pissed off. Um, <laughs> you wanna do anything with the character, it's gonna affect your real life. So I got away, there's some of the characters that are still with the originals, but all characters in the future, are, like people are like, oh, you gotta put me in your comic. Never again. <laughs> so, no, I don't really talk to Danny anymore. I have no idea what happened to Luca. Helen was in here. She left pretty quickly. I'm trying to remember the original, who, who was based on real people. I specifically introduced this character, Susie G, who was the blonde you saw in the very first panel, because I was like, I need a character that is not a real Well, and there was the evil doctor, somebody. Dr. Uh, Goldfinger. Yes. Yes. His identity will be will remain unnamed. Any others? I know we're a little bit past the time, but nobody wants the room. Uh, You're I all can, welcome to go. I can just come and thank you very much for you. You know, talking about uh, this long story of 20 years. Uh, but uh, during our, I think it was 15th anniversary of the department, uh, um, 2008 or so, um, uh, there was a uh, uh, great to donate a certain number of um, uh, his comic strips. So we have a small book booklet that everybody got during that celebration, and some people recognize themselves. <laughs> so the first maybe few years, uh, there were real characters, and uh, students were recognizing themselves, and so on. Uh, and it was really fun. Uh, and one anecdote that I always uh, uh, tell is uh, how real it was, or some people believe that it was real. Uh, one uh, day, Professor Poland then knocked on my door, and he was a graduate student advisor, and he was having the belly call. Probably somebody gave to him. I don't right. know if he read it every day. Uh, and he asked me, is this true? <laughs> <laughs> the character lost his funding. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and his advisor just hung him out to dry. And all that was like, you, you got, we gotta get funding for Derek back right away. 